So, the dire wolf. Prehistoric legend, Ice Age heavyweight, and according to some scientists, it's kind of back. Yep, thanks to genetic editing, we might be looking at the first steps toward a real-life comeback. But before we howl with excitement, let's rewind. What was the real difference between dire wolves and today's grey wolves? The grey wolf and the dire wolf may sound like close kin. After all, both are big bad wolves, right? But their evolutionary journeys split millions of years ago. DNA evidence published in 2021 revealed they last shared a common ancestor about 5.7 million years ago. Enough time for dire wolves to become a distinct lineage. While their bones look superficially similar, dire wolves were so different genetically that even when they lived alongside grey wolves and coyotes in North America, they never interbred. Grey wolves, along with coyotes and jackals, evolved over in Eurasia and only arrived in the Americas relatively late, long after dire wolves had established their turf. The dire wolf even had its genus name, Anasion, meaning terrible wolf, and it earned that title. Grey wolves, on the other hand, belong to Canis, same as modern wolves, dogs, and coyotes. Let's get one thing straight. Dire wolves were big. Maybe not the monster-sized beasts pop culture makes them out to be, but bigger than your average grey wolf. On average, a dire wolf weighed about 60 to 70 kilos, or 130 to 150 pounds. That puts them at the upper limit of even the biggest modern grey wolves, like the Yukon or Northwestern wolves, and roughly 25% heavier than the average grey wolf today. Dire wolves had shorter, thicker legs, smaller feet, and a more compact, muscular body. Their bones were heavier, their frame stockier. Picture a wolf with the build of a heavyweight wrestler. Wide chest, thick limbs, low to the ground. Built for strength, not speed. You're not chasing anything across the tundra with that body. But if something needed to be wrestled to the ground, well, that was their speciality. Grey wolves, by comparison, are athletes. A big male might weigh 45 to 50 kilos, around 100 to 110 pounds, and some exceptional individuals can hit dire wolf sizes. But they're taller, longer-legged, and lean. Their bodies are made for distance and stamina, not brute force. They can run for miles, track prey for hours, and rely on endurance over impact. Dire wolves had larger, wider heads, with massive jaws and reinforced cheekbones. Those zygomatic arches that anchor the jaw muscles. Their snouts were broader, their teeth thicker, and their skulls built to handle serious pressure. Estimates put their bite force at over 1,300 newtons at the canines, the strongest of any known canine. That's bone-breaking power, not just meat slicing. Their canine teeth were also more durable, able to withstand more bending without snapping. Some researchers say their dental strength was close to hyena levels, and the fossil record backs it up. Their teeth show heavy wear and breakage, signs that dire wolves often chewed straight through bone to get to the good stuff. Grey wolves are still impressive. Their bite is powerful enough to bring down moose and break bones, but their teeth are sharper, narrower, and more adapted for slicing rather than smashing. They've got the tools for versatility and not raw force. Dire wolves evolved in a world of giants. North America during the Pleistocene was full of megafauna, bison, ancient horses, camels, ground sloths, and even young mammoths. And dire wolves thrived on that abundance. Fossils and bone chemistry confirm they were specialized big game hunters, focusing on animals weighing hundreds of kilos. They weren't picky about species, they just followed the biggest meat source around. But specialization comes with a risk. When the Ice Age ended and those massive herbivores started disappearing, the dire wolf's main food source vanished too. Smaller prey like deer or rabbits just couldn't support a 150-pound predator that needed a lot of calories to survive. The buffet was gone, and dire wolves couldn't pivot fast enough. Grey wolves, on the other hand, were, and still are, the ultimate generalists. They'll hunt anything – deer, elk, moose, wild boar, beavers, rabbits, even fish or berries when needed. 
Their flexibility gave them a serious edge. They didn't rely on any single food source, which made them far more resilient when the environment changed. Back in the Ice Age, grey wolves probably hunted more megafauna too, but when that option disappeared, they adjusted, shifting to smaller prey, spreading to new habitats, and surviving where specialists like the direwolf couldn't. One of the biggest things wolves are known for, beyond their looks and howls, is their social structure. When it comes to both direwolves and grey wolves, this was a huge part of their success. They were pack hunters. For grey wolves, we know the playbook well. They live in tight-knit family groups, usually led by an alpha male and female who mate for life. The rest of the pack is mostly made up of their offspring and everyone has a role – hunting, protecting territory and raising pups. They communicate with body language, scent and, of course, howling. It's not just instinct. Grey wolves show signs of real social intelligence, strategy and even emotional bonding. But what about dire wolves? They're long gone. No one's had the chance to follow a pack through the snow with a camera. So how do we know? First off, there was very little difference in size between male and female dire wolves, what scientists call low sexual dimorphism. In modern animals, this often means the species lived in monogamous pairs, just like grey wolves do. So if an alpha male and alpha female were leading the pack, and the others were their pups or subordinates, you've got a pack structure that looks very familiar. Second, there's La Brea. Hundreds of dire wolves have been pulled from the tar, likely drawn to trapped prey. A lone predator might stay away, but a pack? That's a calculated risk. They hunted, fed and likely defended kills as a group, even against predators like Smilodon or the American lion. That kind of behaviour tells us dire wolves weren't loners. They were social predators, relying on cooperation not just to hunt, but to compete. So if we imagine a dire wolf pack on the Ice Age plains, it probably wouldn't look too different from a grey wolf pack today. Were dire wolves just as clever as grey wolves? Probably. Pack hunting requires intelligence. You have to communicate, learn from experience and read the situation. Grey wolves today are known for strategic hunting, like driving prey toward ambush zones or testing herds for weaknesses before committing to an attack. Dire wolves, facing even larger and more dangerous prey, likely needed just as much cooperation, maybe more. But there's one area where grey wolves might have had the edge – adaptability. Grey wolf packs today can shift in size and structure depending on the environment, Hunting small prey, they can split into pairs. Going after something huge, they can team up in larger groups. They're flexible. Dire wolves may not have had that kind of wiggle room. Since their prey was so consistently big and tough, they probably always needed strength in numbers. That might have made solo survival tough. If a dire wolf got separated, it wasn't just alone, it was in trouble. We can't say that for certain but it's one of the interesting differences scientists are still looking into. So, were dire wolves social? Absolutely. Probably loyal, probably vocal, probably tight-knit, just like grey wolves. The difference is that grey wolves were built to adjust. Dire wolves were built to dominate in one very specific way. And when that world changed, the rigidity may have cost them. By the end of the Ice Age, around 12,000 years ago, the world had changed fast, and not in the dire wolf's favour. We've already seen how these wolves were tied to big prey, and when that prey disappeared, things got harder. But it wasn't just about food. Multiple pressures were hitting all at once, and dire wolves just couldn't keep up. For one, there was new competition. As the climate warmed and ecosystems shifted, Grey wolves and coyotes began spreading into areas where dire wolves had ruled. These smaller, more adaptable canids were better suited for the changing world. They could hunt small game, scavenge, travel farther, and even live in smaller groups. Then there's the genetic isolation factor. Grey wolves and coyotes could interbreed with each other, and even with early domestic dogs, sharing useful traits and possibly improving disease resistance. Dire wolves were too different genetically. They couldn't hybridize. 
that may have made them more vulnerable to new pathogens, especially as humans and their animals spread through the continent. And yes, humans were part of the equation too. Early hunters entered the Americas around the same time the megafauna declined. Whether directly or indirectly, they likely helped speed up the collapse of the big herbivore populations direwolves depended on. Just when you think the direwolf story ended 10,000 years ago, science throws a curveball. Recently, Colossal Biosciences announced the creation of a functional direwolf, not through cloning, but by editing 20 specific genes in modern grey wolves based on DNA fragments recovered from fossils, including a 13,000-year-old tooth. These genes were linked to traits like growth, skull shape, coat texture, and body size. The result? Three pups born in late 2024 named Romulus, Remus, and Khaleesi, showing early signs of direwolf-like features such as chunkier builds, broader heads, and thicker fur. They're now being raised in a private reserve under close monitoring, with input from indigenous groups to ensure cultural and ethical considerations are respected. While the project has generated excitement, many scientists caution that this isn't true de-extinction, at least not yet. Editing 20 genes touches only a fraction of what made dire wolves genetically distinct, and some paleontologists point out that the pups remain over 99% grey wolf. Still, Colossal positions this effort as a proof of concept, a first step toward restoring the ecological roles once filled by extinct apex predators. It's part of their broader vision, which also includes attempts to revive species like the woolly mammoth and the dodo. That's all for today. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share it with your friends. You can also leave a comment with what you would like to see in the following videos. Thanks for watching. See you next time.